I, this is a long time ago. I had an athlete say, you know, I've got this, I do this, 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 uh, on my phone, I got this ab training app. Uh, and I, so I do abs all the time. And I said, I said, how's it going? You know, you, are you getting stronger? And I knew, cause I've been working with this athlete that, that he wasn't a great mover at that time. Uh, he goes, you know, I don't, that doesn't feel like it. And I said, okay. Uh, you know, so I educated him on like, sometimes we have to add context to our ab work, meaning like we have to do ab work that, that feeds us towards a movement that, or a position that we need to get into. So like, for example, like the reverse crunch, you know, to help, you know, getting a posterior tilt in a squat, like that's a, that's a kind of a step one exercise, but it's feeding the skill of being able to do that, you know, to counter new tape, posterior tilt, so you can get deep ranges in the squat. That was Ty Terrell, and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. Welcome to another show. It's awesome to have you guys here. So this one was a really, this was a really special episode. It really, um, if there was like a, a running theme of this show, uh, there's, I guess maybe there's a few of them in a lot of different topics, but in terms of the themes and what we're doing in the gym and a gym setting for training athletes, uh, one thing that I'm very passionate about because I have the burned hand of being a product of this is returning elasticity to athletes who have lost it over the years by doing barbell training incorrectly. Um, and so we had a recent show with Kyle Dobbs just two episodes ago talking about internal rotation, restoring that, how hingy back squatting and knees out can create a paradigm that's not going to be conducive for elastic athletic power. Uh, this show is going to, that, that show hands the baton to this show. Uh, Ty Terrell, by the way, is currently an NBA physical prep coach. He has a wealth of experience ranging from training athletes out of a uh, two-car garage in his beginnings with Lee Taft to coaching high school basketball uh, to mentorships from people like like Lee to also Bill Hartman and Mike Robertson at IFAST, as well as coaching athletes from youth to pro. Uh, Ty has a unique and powerful perspective on blending gym training methods with athletic biomechanics and outputs. Uh, so this show... We're going to start by really going to get into some products of Ty's mentorships and how he has created his own system and methodology by blending some of these uh, top shelf ideas from some of the experts that he's worked with. And so he'll, we'll, get, we'll start by him getting into his start with Lee Taft, some of the top things that he learned from Lee in creating athletic speed, training athletic speed, and going through just the process of being a coach. We'll then transition into getting into again all things squat but there's so many shows that i think we really need to spend time on the squat because it's the king of the lifts but it's also something that we can really create movement paradigms with athletes that are not maximally conducive to their long-term potential if we don't know what to look for so ty is going to get into his uh, learnings from bill hartman and the work of the human body as a pressure-based system and apply that to squatting apply that to the core and the trunk and the pelvis and apply that to what he's seeing on the court in these athletes and how they move. And it's just a real from whether you're working with the pro athlete population or youth or anyone in between, there's a lot of awesome stuff in this show that I know you can apply. And there definitely was for me. Oh, well, also last thing we are, we do, uh, we get into a little bit of applied reflexive core training on the back end of this show. This one was awesome. So I'm excited to get it to you. Let's get on to it. Episode 222 with Coach Ty Terrell. Ty, man, it's good to have you on. I know it's certainly an interesting time in the world of professional sports and professional basketball these days. Yeah, that's that's for sure. That's an understatement. Yeah, I'm glad we could actually make this time fit. I think we it was a couple of schedules that we had to like, you know, work around and, and cancellations and, and redoing, but here we finally are. No, I appreciate that. I'm excited. Uh, obviously, I know you put out. I've, I've listened to your podcast for a while, and it's got a lot of great content. And, and uh, so, just to be a part of that's a that's an honor, and, and I can't wait. I'm excited to do this. Yeah. So I know you're in pro basketball now, and I know you mm-hmm. know, you started with uh, someone who's, or uh, I mean, maybe not your start start, but one of the foundational uh, teachers you've had is Lee Taft, and he's been on this show. And I, I'd like to get into rather than saying what's your life story, just what are what were some things uh, maybe you could explain quickly your your relationship with Lee but then what were some really big things that you learned from him like some rocks that have stuck with you and your what you're implementing today 
Yeah, I mean, so I Lee was my start star, and um, I was uh, working at a basketball camp, and we, we talked off off air, and I was just having to be coaching his daughter, and without giving the whole story, um, he had just moved from New York to a small town in Indiana where I'm from. That's where his wife was from, and so hence why his kids were at this camp. Um, and he saw me coaching, saw me in, in enjoying coaching, and he asked if I would be interested in uh, you know training athletes, and I said, yeah, sure, absolutely, and this was like young 20s. Um, and, uh, so they just, everything just took off from there. And, uh, I appreciate Lee because I think he's the ultimate, I think he's like the ultimate teacher, the ultimate coach. Um, a couple things that I took from him is, well, the number one thing. And, and so coming from not having like an exercise science background, not having a formal education in this at that time, um, you know, you're kind of overwhelmed by, you know, you're trying to, you know, there's anatomy and there's physiology and there's physics and there's biomechanics and all these things that you can, you know, get overwhelmed with and dive into, um, let alone now we got programming and all the things that that feeds into. Uh, but Lee just made it really simple for me. And I think that's the beauty of his, his coaching. And that's the thing I've tried to take with me is then he, he told me one time, he goes, well, what do you want it to look like? Just make it look like that. And I, and I, and I've passed that on to so many coaches, uh, you know, especially young ones that are asking for advice, uh, you know, with all the information out here today, we can get, you can go from you can skip all the, the you know the boring fundamental stuff and you can go to the most complex uh, sciences out there. Um, you know there's there's a lot of courses you can take and everything like that. Um, and it's easy for us to to now to kind of live in the deep end of the pool. Um, but so, you know sometimes the most important stuff and, and the stuff that helps us uh, be better coaches is is you know right in the shallow end so to speak. So he he just kept it real simple for me. He said, well, what do you want it to look like? And then make it look like that. And so why that was worked for me so well is it, it took the pressure off of me having to know all the sciences at that time um, and know what's going on. I just needed to have a model of what I wanted a squat to look like, what I wanted a cut to look like, you know, what I wanted an athletic stance to look like uh, and so forth. And then it's up to me to design an exercise uh, to, you know, put the athlete in a good position. So, I love that because without, again, without having that formal education, that formal background, he put the onus on me just to be a, a creative coach. And that helped develop me. Uh, and I and, and, and I think it's the most important thing that's happened to me in my career is that when I started, um, Lee made me be a coach first. Um, and, and I think like, you know, obviously school, like we, you know, when we go through get an exercise science degree, it's, you know, textbook, 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 then you're a coach. And I was a coach first. So then when I went to the textbooks, I had so much context that I was able to apply to the science in the textbook. And it just was able to, you know, like speed up my learning curve so fast. So uh, for the young coaches out there, for anybody who's kind of like just kind of in the weeds of, of some complicated stuff, you know, I just make it look like what you want it to look like. You know, are you, are you like if you're supposed to shift into a hip, are you rotating or are you side bending? Well, you don't. The side bending looks funky, so all right, so it must be rotating like this. So you just make it look like that. Um, you can design any exercise any way you want to make it look like that. So that was number one for sure. Uh, number two is like guided guided teaching, and it's okay for things to not be what you ultimately want them to be right like today, as long as they are showing improvements and you're giving a good input. You know, so let's say. Uh, you know, uh, uh, going into a cut, you know, an athlete is too high going into a cut or their plan angle is, you know, the foot's too underneath them. You don't get it wide enough. Um, you know, anything like that. Maybe they don't change, you know, their level uh, like you wanted to. So, you know, keep guiding them, giving them an appropriate, putting them, putting them in a good situation where they can start to uh, explore and find those, those, those attributes, those skills, those, those, those uh, movements. And, um, uh, and then, you know, build from there. But as long as you have forward momentum, it's okay not to be perfect today. That was those two things. I, I know they're more probably feel a lot, you know, kind of mental, uh, philosophical there, but um, like they've just been absolutely huge uh, for me to understand that one, um, you know, coaching is, is the priority. And, you know, you just, again, just helps. It takes the stress off the, the pressure off and you just make it look like what you want. Uh, but two, um, just the, like the pressure of not having to be perfect today, but also respecting that, as long as this is part of a process and it has momentum or moving in a good direction, you know, it's, it's okay that it's not perfect today. And it lets like, these are like, these are, these are athletes, these are people. And, you know, I grew up, or my career started with working with young athletes. 
Um, you know, I work with, you know, pros, but I, I've started working with young ones. So they're exploring movement, you know, as much as I'm exploring coaching at that time when I was starting my coaching career. So uh, expecting uh, perfection and slowing them down would have been a, a huge mistake. So those two things for sure. Um, and I, if I had a third one, watching Lee coach, and this, I don't want to like sit here and act like I'm praising Lee for the last five, six minutes, but his understanding of external forces and how they act on the body and how you can use external forces on the body to get what you want uh, is pretty phenomenal. What I mean by that is, let's say someone's going into a cut too high. Well, you know, just a simple little band pull into the cut drops their level, you know, changes, you know, in, in if, because if they don't, they pull over. So it's just a reaction to the external stimulus. And let's say they're moving in one direction. So if I want someone to go forward and I've got a band around them, let's say I'm standing to their side with a band around them and I want them to go a, a little bit forward. Well, I just move one step behind them. So it's still a lateral pull on the band, but it's a little behind them. So now the response to that is going to be pushing in the opposite direction, you know, so it's going to be going a little bit lateral and forward. So just little things like that, understanding how forces are uh, act on the body and the body response to them um, was huge. And those three things have are very much at the heart, you know, of what I still do. Yeah, I like that. I think that all those three things can be applied to pretty much any coaching situation. I know I like um, I like the idea of, of, of using it to fit a biomechanical model because I've heard people criticize, oh, just, just resisting and, and moving around doesn't necessarily mean anything, just having a band. Right. But if you're using it for a purpose, like I'm yes. trying to draw you into the cut so you have no choice but to get lower to get out of this, it's exactly. now it's, it's more meaningful. And I think people don't, it's easy for people to see people doing, and maybe maybe sometimes they are doing it mindlessly when they're just resisting, and sometimes maybe they do have that purpose. <laughs> but right. I think you have to be able to see and know and say, hey, this is, or it's the same thing as sprinting linearly with a sled behind you. And where is it attached to you? Is it attached to your belt and your hip to pull your hip back? Is it attached to your you know torso? And, an ex, you know, and I Absolutely. think that's, that's really cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it means something, right? Like, again, like, you know, you're, you're, you're changing you know, where the, where the, you know, forces kind of entering the body are, are connected to the body, right. You know, where the, where the load is, you know, your example with the, with the sled and the bell, you know, and you're, it, it does change what you're doing and, and potentially the outcome, you know, of, of that training. So it's, it's, it's hugely important, I think. Yeah. It's funny. Cause all these years of doing speed training on my own end, I've never really paid that terribly much thought to, uh, like an X, like a like a torso versus uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, like a belt level, and I'm just thinking of some things like you know what's your if it's on if it's on your chest, you'd have to like push your xiphoid forward, which could be advantageous for being more upright running. And so there's so yeah. many there's so many possibilities there. I even think about uh, Chris Corfus and I talked about uh, on the last time he was on doing an exergeny resisted where it's like the the blind of pull is diagonal to where you're going so now there's a yeah. unique external force to deal with and oh absolutely yeah so it's like that yeah it's like proprioceptive variability and like with the goal in mind and where just i that's just i think that's a really cool principle to see how that changes changes things well like yeah so if i'm if i'm running in a straight line and you get the exergeny like off to my you know behind me to my left is that like so so it's it's pulling me back and to the left, but I'm running in a straight line forward. So that puts a lot of emphasis on that left leg. And so you're literally doing a diagonal cut every time mm -hmm. that left foot hits the ground. So you can, you know, you know, again it's 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 while you're not really making a cut, you still have a diagonal, like a you know, a semi lateral force acting on the body. And so, you know, the you are, you are making a cut. Every time that left foot hits the ground, it's the propulsive aspect of a cut. And, and, uh, which, you know, maybe that's what that athlete needs to work on. Who knows? Yeah. I think too, that makes me think about, I think it was, it might've been Boosh next Seder or, or Scott Sawasser. <laughs> Sometimes I get confused <laughs> with who said it. Uh, I, I think, I, I think it was Scott. Um, I don't know if and maybe Boo had something. In, I think maybe both of them said this on some level. Uh, but the idea of change of direction, how important change of direction was from even just a plyometric pers or just an athletic mm -hmm. perspective. There's so many things to be found in change of direction that actually translate to things like like jump. Well, jumping even is a change of direction, right? Like, yep. and it's not. It is. Yep. In some ways, it's not that terribly differently related. But I think it's interesting to think about. Yeah, like what you're saying. You're turning. You're adding cut 
elements into that uh-huh. sprint when you have that lateral oblong. And I think about the foot that's, yeah, you were talking about the foot, like if it's left side oblong resistance, that left foot is getting loaded in the unique way where it's, pro, you know, it's propulsion. And I think about too, like it getting to maybe the inside edge, like the more pronation element of that foot to fight mm. it. I'm curious what exactly happens. I actually need to go do this after the show and, and find yes. out and get back to you. So <laughs> it's just really cool how those things make a change. So I think like, so, you know, to your point about, and I think this is such an awesome point, uh, how you mentioned there are, um, you know, kind of overlapping concepts or, or, or concepts that are intertwined between, you know, cutting and jumping and, you know, all these things, cause they are change of directions. But I, I kind of have a simplistic thought process in the sense of the body's designed to move a certain way, you know, and in that, in that our, our gait is how we're designed. And then the internal mechanisms of, of, um, <clears throat> you know, how we create stability and, 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 you know, create an environment internally for, you know, force production, all these things, like those are pretty universal. And then the phases of movement, you know, going from, you know, eccentric to concentric and, and all that are, are pretty universal too. So uh, what you're really doing is just implying those kind of first principle basic concepts, you know, with to a different context, whether it's cutting, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, jumping and things like that, we still have to go through a loading phase an amortization phase and a propulsive or concentric phase, you know, different, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you still have to go through those phases, you know, regardless of if it's a cut and I'm single leg, it's a counter movement jump and I'm bilateral. Um, if it's, you know, a linear sprint with a diagonal, you know, ob- like you said, an oblong uh, resistance, um, regardless of what it is, we still have to go through those phases. Um, you know, some of them are depending on the action is faster than others. But uh, if, if you unwrap all that stuff, there's these universal concepts that are that are kind of with, you know, kind of intertwined in all those movements. So uh, I love that thought of yours. Like there's there's not a lot of difference. It's just it's the same stuff happening with just different context, you know, single leg angles, double leg, whatever it is. Uh, so it's pretty cool to think about it like that. And it's simple. It is at its heart. It's very simple, but it can get complex if you want it to be. And, really okay. want, and you want to dig into all the things that happen, all the little nuances that happen when you do XYZ. I was even thinking too, a thought that just came in my head is people talk about getting low uh, for jumping, like especially like a running mm-hmm. two leg jump. You watch those guys who are really getting up, they're in like a low seat position. Yep. Uh, I mean, even single leg to a, to a degree, but it's not quite the same as those guys who are really mm-hmm. getting down there on that two leg jump. And I was like, well, what if you could hook up the extra genie or a band behind them, but pulling, but a Darian bar has, has taught me this in doing starts with the X. I, I use the extra genie. I think he was using something else, but where you actually put the extra genie up vertically behind you. And so it'd be like, it, let's say it's, it's eight feet here. Uh, I hooked it to an eight foot high fence directly behind me. And now I have to drop mm-hmm. my shins harder to take every step. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, which is cool. Actually, I haven't, I need to start, <laughs> I need to do a lot of the, revisit a lot of this stuff. Uh, but I, um, cause I hadn't, I hadn't used the extra genie in actually a little while, but I was just thinking the same thing perhaps you could use for jumping. Like if someone has yep. problems like getting down in a seat position, you're giving them something to work with proprioceptively to try to manipulate their body and, so. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and, and that's what that's what training is, right? We're trying to find the the input that achieves what we want with our athletes, you know, whether that's, you know, assisted band stuff or, or you know, you know, an angle here, an angle there. It doesn't matter. We're just trying to find a way, you know, to, you know, again, come back to what Lee taught me, you know, make it look like you want it to look, um, you know, let it happen with the output that you want it to happen with. Uh, and then, you know, whatever rate of speed that it needs to happen at. So those, you know, those are the three things that are, that are really, you know, that you're looking at in a, if you're looking at a single motion in athletic, it's, you know, you know, can you achieve the position? Uh, you know, can you produce the force that you need to in the time that you need to? Um, and then, you know, you add in the context of the situation and that's actually how, so if I had to like, you know, everybody's like, I got a model, I got a model. And, and, and so sometimes that word it's, you know, I think it's starting to get overused a little bit, but like, you know, my model is just that, you know, I got, it's kind of, I base it off of like the task organism environment, you know, and it's, you know, can you achieve the position? Can you produce the force? And, you know, can you thrive in the situation and the situation between like on a turf and a gym and a situation on a basketball court or a football field, you know, with fans and competition, like those are obviously different situations, but, um, you know, you have to be able to answer yes to all three of those questions if you want to be, you know, productive on the field, you know, at least uh, in the context of like an athletic movement. I like what you said too about not having to be perfect today. Cause I feel like a lot of, 
if there's anything I've kind of gotten away from over the years, it's, and maybe there was something intuitive about it too, but like not, not needing to see an athlete hit a position for one thing and then not needing you Mm -hmm. to see that. Like, it's almost like you have this hammer and you know, I need you to be in this position. So we're just going to get you, but it's like, maybe that athlete isn't ready to be in that position. Maybe their body type doesn't even belong in that position, you know, like, and so there's a learning phase that comes with that. And then there's, you know, like internalizing stuff helps you learn for sure. But in a, in a, in a, industry or a, a kind of an environment like an athletic environment whether it's weightlifting or doing you know speed and agility or you know co- whatever like if you're internalizing all the time you're kind of like you're you're kind of freezing yourself up a little bit and i'm not saying that's not important like if you need to regress and and you know and find this position and kind of feel what that looks like to enhance the learning process or move it move it forward by all means you know take the time to do that but you know the best you know if the athlete is able to do things like achieve the position, for example, like let's say I'm loading a cut and I know an athlete has a certain amount of range of motion, uh, you know, an acceptable range of motion to be able to hit the position that that cut, you know, that they need to hit. So perhaps the regression is not even needed for that. So I don't need to go back and, you know, and and work on mobility or whatever it is that you're working on. So maybe I just need to give a better cue. You know, maybe I need to give better guidance. Maybe I need to give less less resistance or no resistance at all in that situation. So you just gotta, you know, you gotta, again, create the environment for that athlete uh and and continue to you know just kind of groove that and give the cue and give the cue because man it's not going to be pretty at first it rarely is and uh, that's why we work on stuff you know I, that's that's why it's called practice i wanted to take a quick break from the show to share with you a little bit about what our sponsor simplyfaster.com now has available in their store You hear me mention in the outro of the show all the time about the free lap timing system in the K-Box, which I have and use regularly. But today I wanted to share a little bit more about the bar speed monitoring units that Simply Faster has, which is the GymWare and the new portable flex unit. So let me start with the GymWare. I mention it regularly on the show. It's been referred to as the Cadillac of bar speed monitors. Carl Valley calls it a lab inside a lunchbox, as the readings you get out of the gym work go well beyond typical concentric or just up the up phase of the lift velocities. Rather, you can measure the entire shape of the barbell lift in terms of eccentric velocity, range of motion, and total work done. Total work being awesome, by the way, especially like comparing a long-armed bench presser or a 6'10 squatter versus a 5'11 point guard. So you're getting all these extra metrics that you're not getting on other units. It's perfect for teams wanting to manage the weight room and the data synchronizes to software platforms such as Coach Me Plus, Team Builder, and Athlete Monitoring. So new to the store is the Flex, which is the ultra portable and lower price travel version of the coach's favorite gym wear. So just like the gym wear, the Flex measures the shape of each rep, range of motion, total work done, eccentric dynamics, So for this and the gym aware, this is the advantage that a force plate would have over just knowing how high you jumped. You're getting many other metrics and information that go into this unit of work. Compared to similar portable bar speed monitors, this unit gets the entire rep rather than a fraction. So you have here two awesome tools. And if you're interested in upping your game in the velocity-based training and bar speed world, I would definitely recommend heading to the store at simplyfaster.com and checking into these two units. All right, let's get back to the show. I know you've worked with quite the range of athletes from youth to pro. And so how, I mean, by the time an athlete's a pro, their movement is, I would assume it's quite good. Uh, I mean, you couldn't, you can't get to pro being in the NBA without being able to move at least on a pretty darn good level. So how do you approach the, the, the elite versus the, the 10 year old or, or, you know, things like that. How, where's the, some pointers on those differences? Yes. This is a, this is a phenomenal question. Cause this is, this is uh, I've had this conversation so many times since I've gotten, you know, and even when I was, you know, at IFAS working with pro athletes before I, I, I went to the NBA, uh, this was a question, you know, that we talked about a lot too, but um, I'll answer it like this, you know, with the NBA, like you say, like, like you would expect them to be, these guys, like in any pro athlete, was football, baseball, they're phenomenal dynamic movers for the most part. Um, they're incredible, just reactive athletes. When it comes to basic human movements, they, they a lot of times, and I'm generalizing here, but because of the height 
the the structure. So like most of these guys, like for example, like the pro basketball players are just kind of narrow. Like they're just kind of like these thin tubes that have been stretched out to six, eight, and seven feet tall or whatever. Well, it's it's hard for those narrow tubes to like kind of compress or like kind of an accordion, you know, like come, you know, like in a squat and, and, and be able to flex, you know, the, the, the ankle, the knee, the hip, you know, to get in a position where they can change levels and they can accept load. These pro athletes are typically concentric, just concentrically gifted athletes. So they live their life at the elite and, a lot of times what we spend our time doing, and this is just what I found again, this is in the private sector and this in the, in the you know, team sector is that um, we, we spend a lot of our time working on the basics of movements and fundamentals of movement. You know, you know, can you squat well without modifications? Can you do push uh, Because not because I want them to be able to do 50 pushups. Cause like, I, you know, not like, you know, Hey, you know, any man should be able to do 50 pushups, not because of that, but because if, they perform that push up well and they can perform that push up well through, you know, a lot of reps that tells me that they can kind of create proximal, you know, stability, you know, core stability, if you, whatever term you want to use uh, and, and produce strength in their extremities. Uh, and, you know, if you're a power lifter, like, Oh, you know, you would talk about, you know, inner abdominal pressure. Well, that's the proximal stability that I mean, you know, power lifters wear belts and, you know, and do their breathing before a rep for a reason. They're trying to build up, inner abdominal pressure to get for, to have the strongest platform, the most stable platform possible to be able to produce a bunch of force off of. So like to kind of give you a, a, a visual of that, if I was on a mattress and I tried to push off, like in like, you know, do like a five yard acceleration sprint um, with the mattress being my push off versus concrete, like I'm obviously going to be faster in my, you know, my push off is going to be better with the concrete. So if you don't have that that inner abdominal pressure, that core, you know, stiffness, that proximal control uh, or stability, you don't have, you know, a concrete platform to produce force of. You can't get tension or as much tension out into the muscle. So like, um, that's a big part of what we do. Like these guys, again, they're just they're 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 gifted more than they are. Um, they're gifted movers, gifted with output more than they are like they don't really have like the fundamentals all the time. Now some do. And I, again, I'm generalizing. Um, so we spend a lot of time working on that because they already have the output piece. So like if I was just like an average high school athlete, a lot of times what we're chasing is output, you know, strength, power, you know, speed, et cetera. Um, these guys for the most part already have that. So if you did a needs analysis, then you would just say, okay, I'm not going to train the thing that they already have. I'm going to train the thing they don't have. And then once that's trained and we kind of get all the pillars, you know, up to the same place, then we can start thinking about like, you know, okay, so how do we, you know, make this more powerful? How do we, you know, shape their force velocity characteristics to be where they need to be, um, you know, for their position, et cetera. Um, But it's, we usually start at the fundamentals, then work our way back up. As the, as I move towards the younger kids, I mean, you get a 10 year old, and again, this is, I'm generalizing for the most part, like, you know, they're pretty, pretty compliant. They're pretty, you know, they don't have years of, of physical stress on their body um, to even let kind of compensatory, you know, strategies in, on, on the body even come into play. So typically with a little guidance and things like that and the right exercise progression, like they can typically move well. Um, and I'm just talking like the fundamentals, like, can you squat, you know, can you hinge, can you lunge, like, those are the, the the basic movements that are all other movements are built off of. And so um, I spend more time, like when I was with the younger kids, we teach that when something is ready to be loaded, we load it. And then with the mind, like uh, around, like, where are we heading? Um, now it takes some, you know, it takes a long time. I think I've read like in old Russian texts and I may be wrong, but about, you know, like I've heard like it takes three years to build a foundation that's a long time. A lot of people spend like one summer or one year training and they're like, okay, I've got my foundation. Let's do some, you know, some special methods or, you know, whatever. And, and the truth is like, you know, you, you probably need a little bit longer uh, to build your foundation so that we can have an amazing platform to build power and things off of. The great thing about working with younger kids, everybody knows that um, you don't have to necessarily focus on power to improve their power because they're just improving everything. Cause it's so, you know, they're so, they're such novices. It's so new to them. 
Um, so it kind of is like you kind of you can have a little cheat code there. You can focus on doing things well today, letting them explore movement, um, you know, and, and then build up, uh, you know, knowing that things are like the outputs are still going to improve. So that's kind of the difference where, like, I would say that, you know, the, the younger kids, they kind of pick up the they don't have these compensatory strategies like, you know, in their body that we have to you know, peel off and they kind of get the fundamentals pretty quick. Uh, and then it's just a matter of, you know, building up the capacity of those fundamentals and progressing them appropriately. As with the, you know, the elite guys, they have the output already. They're gifted. They were kind of like, you know, chosen at birth to say, okay, you have the potential to be a pro athlete. Um, it's the simple stuff that they don't do well because they've never had to, you know, the, the, the average, again, high school athlete, has to learn how to squat well so that he can improve his output because he needs to get as close to his ceiling as possible for him to be a dynamic, you know, collegiate athlete or whatever. Whereas the pro athlete, if you were just kind of born like that, you know, you can just go out and, and play. You can go out and hoop, you can go out and play, you know, baseball, football, whatever, uh, without, you know, necessarily working on your explosiveness because you already, you already have it. But I will say this, it's the fundamentals that save the pro athletes. Because I, yeah, it's it's you know these are uh, bodies that have a lot of miles on them, um, or they will eventually, uh, and so it's the fundamentals teaching them to be you know create that 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 stability where they need it, uh, teaching them to be able to go through a full excursion of motion. So um, you know the, the you know the normal ranges and you know in a squat or a push up or whatever. Uh, there's orthopedic norms that we should be able to you know kind of run through um, from a range of motion standpoint. And so trying to restore that with these guys and then, you know, helping them and then they're progressing them to add capacity and resiliency to that. And what I mean by resiliency is if they have kind of compensations or movement compensations in their body and we, we're, we're trying to strip those off, they're going to have a strong tendency to go back to that, 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 that compensation if we don't build up resiliency in the body. So, you know, if I have, if it takes me, 3,000 newtons of force to drive somebody, you know, to sprint by somebody as a receiver in football, but my, you know, peak force is 3,500. And this is kind of, you know, this is arbitrary and a little bit, you know, uh, simplistic here. Every time I take a, a sprint, do a, you know, a, you know, a, you know, a fly route or whatever, I'm literally operating at, you know, near max of my force production. So how many times can you do near max efforts before your body just says, I don't have much left. I need to cheat somehow. Um, so if we can peel back those or peel off those compensations, add capacity to their body. So let's say, let's use a squat, for example, if I can squat a hundred pounds without, you know, how, you know, nice and, you know, nice, perfect squat, hundred pounds. That's great. That's probably not enough, uh, to build my capacity to where I'll be able to resist my compensations for four quarters of basketball or four quarters of football or whatever. So you need to continue to build that up. Sometimes this is just, and sometimes building it up doesn't mean, you know, to this incredible one rep max, sometimes building up means to like, okay, finding that, that what's the minimal I have to be at to lift, but being able to repeat that over and over again, you know, for however many efforts in a game. Um, I know that was like a long answer, but like it kind of I think it's important to, to know these kind of side spin off things uh, from that question. Yeah, I mean, I asked a pretty loaded question there that that could have been. No, a little I show. So I, I will unpack that. I want to and I'm, I have to write a few notes down because there's a few things I want to circle back to. that I think will be a good transition yeah. to talking about your time at iFast. But yeah. I think about because I, I do think about different needs and different like buckets to fill and what are what's needed. And I think about like with with just some of the rudimentary stuff like just those i think about what jeremy frisch has mentioned with with dan paff and like rudimentary like gym class activity and almost how that can kind of clean up technique sometimes without necessarily even need to get to technique like there's that bucket of general physical competencies and movement and then they may be similar to that is like the strength bucket but the strength in a compensation free manner bucket and then you have output like output skill right like and that's what i wanted to ask you like is there a, a uh, an instance where an nba player ever needs help like with a cut you know what i'm saying like do they is, is that ever in in the or is it all general like how does that fit in oh no absolutely all the time uh, in in 
the number one thing that I think uh, I find that this population needs is the ability to squat. And I, you know, I will reference the squat a lot because of what it means to me, like how I interpret the squat. Like if you can squat well, um, you know, not there's some people say you shouldn't go parallel, whatever, and then you know, stress on the knees, et cetera, et cetera. We have orthopedic like our norms of, of range of motions, and so we're we're supposed to have a certain you know degree of hip flexion and things like that. So we have the ability to access these extreme ranges, and so, or what's like might be deemed extreme range. So when I see someone who can squat, that tells me that they can maintain proximal control of their spine, their rib cage, their pelvis. They can, it can go through uh, the, ex- the full excursion of motion, motion from loading to unloading. Um, and even internally, there's things happening there. Um, like when you, uh, when you squat, as you get, as you go down, your, your kind of everything, like your pelvis expands uh, to be able to receive, you know, the, the, the downward force in, in there. So there's, there's, there's pressure building up in, in there and, you know, the, the pelvis expands. Well, that's your deceleration. So if I want to, to load something, you know, I have to be able to, to squat. Um, I have to be able to expand. And if I want to unload something or, or, or propel myself or explode out of this in a concentric fashion, you know, why do, you, why do boxers exhale when you punch? Why do you exhale when you come up for a squat? Because exhaling squeezes everything and so it's it's the opposite it's the comeback from the you know the recoil from the expansion and so exhale is propulsion it's 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 output and so i want to see that you can do that i want to see that you can go through a loading phase controlling the spine ribs hips everything like that where they're supposed to be can you get your you know can you get your knee over your toes and you know there's obviously that's a topic also in the industry but like my argument to that would be like, that's an important shin angle. If you never are able to reach that shin angle, then you can forget about cutting. You can forget about an athletic stance. You can forget about most athletic movements and all, maybe all of them, because you have to be able to obtain that shin angle. You also have to be able to change your level. And so if I'm, if I'm dribbling a ball, you know, and I go from like just a, you know, a dribble to a, you know, a crossover, when I cross over, I change my level so that I can get a good acceleration angle you know, a good body lean, you know, or if I'm coming into a cut, you know, it's, I, 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 I lower my center of gravity in a cut. So, cause it helps me manage my momentum. It helps load the joints, the musculature around those joints so that they can ramp up force production to stop my momentum and then redirect me. So the first thing I'm going to work on with a guy is the ability to cut. And that doesn't matter, or the ability to squat. So it doesn't matter what population I'm with. We're going to learn to squat because I think that's the foundation of athletic movement. And um, and it's it's not. I mean, all the other ones are important too, but I think the squat is the baseline. We got to start there. So here's and here's why. So if I want to have a, if I want to go uh, push right to left, let's say I'm doing like a lateral shuffle or a cut, and I'm going to push right to left. If I can't change my level or if I can't squat down to a certain point, my push angle is going to be too vertical. So like if you're just standing up and you try to move your right foot out as far as you can, but you stay tall, like it's only going to go out an inch or so. That's a very vertical. If you look at the angle of your leg, how you put that angle that you push into the ground in is the angle that you're going to move. So like if if it's out two inches and I push in the ground, I'm going to be it's going to move me up for the most part. But if I can change levels, I can get my leg out wider. I can get a more horizontal, uh, uh, you know, uh, cut angle, and, and, and that will propel me more laterally than vertically. Um, so that's huge. So if you want to get your foot out wider away from your body, you have to be able to lower your center of gravity. You have to be able to squat. Um, so that's where, like, cutting and, 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 you know, whether it's loading or coming out of a cut, that's where it starts for me. So – um, I will start there at the same time I'm working on that squat though. I'm working on kind of components of cutting, right? So like, um, so if I go into a left foot cut, the moment my foot hits the ground, my body is producing force to stop my momentum in that cut and then eventually overcome that momentum and send me in a different direction. So things to, we'll work on things to ramp up 
the rate of that force production, the magnitude of that force production um, in, in while we're working on the squat. So it could be like, you know, I don't feel like toe drops or like, like, like Lee has like a fake med ball throw or like, you know, Bosch has like the, you know, the water, you know, fake throws, the water ball, fake throws and all that stuff. Like if I do a, so if I want to increase my rate of force production on my left leg going into a cut and I take a med ball and I go from my right shoulder to my left hip and like a really fast, hard fake slam, then that's driving forces into my leg. So to stop the momentum of that, my left leg has to, or that whole left side has to, you know, produce force really quickly. Then we can turn that into a toe drop or a, a lateral leap, whatever you want to call it. Um, like a, you know, like a lateral leap and stick. Um, and then, you know, you, so you're, and then maybe just like, you know, ice skaters or Haydn's, you know, re, you know, continuous or whatever. Um, maybe you use that ball with those fake throws every time that foot hits the ground, maybe you don't, but there's things like that. We're, we're ramping up, um, the RFD and the magnitude of the force production while we're working on the mechanics and obviously all within reason, all within acceptable, uh, you know, loads, acceptable, um, you know, speeds and things like that, that, that don't take the athlete uh, too far away from, you know, kind of how we want it to be executed. So it's happening concurrently. Um, and again, it's just about manipulating the exercise to, to, you know, to make it look like what you want to get what you want out of it. Um, but yeah, definitely we're working on cutting, but like, again, the squats, the foundation of that. Um, and, um, and these guys move so fast and they're so tall that the, you know, the, the ability to, to lower their center of gravity so they can manage these speeds uh, is, I mean, it's a, it's paramount and it's a priority for sure. So you, you were talking a little bit about the, the pelvis and the expansion of the pelvis as you drop down and then the expansion to load and then that contraction and reversing it. So I know that fits yep. with Bill Hartman's, what Bill Hartman's yeah. taught. And I, I know you spent that time at IFAST. And so mm-hmm. I was going to ask, how do you, um, are you relating? So is that, how let's just say like a vertical jump or dropping is there times where if an athlete can't expand well like you can actually see that in real time play and say hey or i guess you can't see it you can't actually see it their pelvis is doing it but like just yeah, just through doing rudimentary movements or squatting is yeah. it, like this guy has a hard time expanding his pelvis properly and letting you know i guess you'd say the guts descend to the pelvic floor i'm i know it well enough to be dangerous probably not that yes. not well enough to like to really explain it out there but is that well, uh, how you deal? How you explain that to your players, or is that, yeah. is that part of that? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't say expand your pelvis to the players. Yeah, expand sure. your pelvic floor and let your <laughs> guts yeah. <sit> down. <laughs> you know, just let your guts drop in there. And, and um, I mean, with respect to Bill, obviously, like a lot of this stuff is is uh, he's putting out a lot of phenomenal content. And he's going to depths of things that are uh, I've never really thought imagined uh it's incredible what he's doing and um but with that so so you'll hear some of my language because i'm obviously heavily influenced by bill and uh he's, he's a phenomenal teacher um and i think he would even tell you this but a lot of these concepts are you know these, these he's not creating new concepts he's he's you know uh basically digging to what's really going on he's trying to get down to the, like the what he calls you know what not just he calls but you know the first principle is that you know, if you see something happen and you say why, and then you get an explanation, you say, okay, why? And, and what he's doing is keep saying why until you can't say why anymore. So he's trying to get to the bottom layer of things. So a lot of stuff that, that I'm talking about, like, uh, or you may hear people use like, like Bill's language. Um, it's things that have always happened. Like we're not inventing the way we, you know, reinventing the way we cut or the way we jump or anything. Like, that. like our body has been doing it like this forever. Um, but just the understanding, again, the depth of the mechanisms and things that's happening are, you know, are improving and and he's, and he's pushing that, um, and leading that, I guess I should say. So, but if, if you want to squat, your sacrum has to counter nutate and your pelvis has to tilt backwards. And the reason people with like anterior tilts can't squat well, and I'm, I'm, this is again, going to be very simplistic, but like imagine so if i have to go below parallel my my femur my leg is going if i'm anteriorly tilted it's going to run into a bony block you know and so uh that would be that position that anterior tilt that 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 sacrum forward uh, or nutation is exhalation 
And that's that, that the pelvis gets contracts, it gets smaller, it tightens up and that's exhale. If you want to load, um, you have to inhale. So now the inhaling is counter nutation. The pelvis tilts back and it creates room, you know, for the femurs to come into greater, you know, hip flexion ranges. Um, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm kind of watering this down a little bit also with inhalation. So the reason that, um, like, a like a plate squat, re- like a plate squat, you know, if you're reaching a, a plate out in front of you as far as you can, like a 10 pound plate, the reason that helps you squat better is because it pushes your center of gravity back. So if I reach out with 10 pounds, there's a reaction from the body that my center of gravity goes backwards to counterbalance that weight. Well, when you inhale, if you can inhale like you're supposed to, you should be inhaling like kind of like 360 degrees. But part of that expansion is posteriorly. It's into the back and into the pelvis. And so what you've done is you've created a posterior weight shift with that inhale which we already know allows you to sit down better and load your hips better because we do it with like a plate squat reach or a med ball reach. And, and sometimes, you know, like, uh, like a goblet squat, a front loaded squat is somehow like that's providing a little bit of that too. If I put weight out in front of me, my body has to have a a response posteriorly, uh, a center of gravity response posteriorly, um, to be able to counter that, that weight. And, um, and so the inhalation, not only, physically like moves the pelvis backwards into a posterior tilt so I can reach greater degrees of, of, of hip flexion. And so I can get depth. Um, but that also expands the pelvis when you do that. And it creates that posterior weight shift that allows you to sit down. Uh, and so that's huge. So like if I'm going into a cut, if I'm sprinting into a cut, I'm in fifth gear in my car and, and I'm, you know, just going a million miles an hour. If I want to accept that load uh, then I need to be able to sh- downshift, you know, into first or second gear and, you know, expand uh, to let that my body take that and, and counter nutate so I can change levels and handle the momentum. And just to kind of give you all that may, if that's the first time you're hearing that, or maybe if it's just like, oh, that, that sounds crazy. Just think of it this way. Uh, if I was going to load my right hip, you know, like the back of my right hip, and, and what is the back of my right hip doing? It's expanding. You know, it's the, 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 the glute is eccentrically orienting. So that's loading. So it's the same thing that happens at the pelvis as a structure. And when you go to load it, it expands. And so if I'll go to uh, unload my right hip, that right glute becomes concentric. It shortens, compresses, and that's how you get movement or, or, or propulsion in whatever direction you want to. So the same thing happens in like a, in a counter movement jump if you're, or a squat. You're going straight down, straight up. To load, you expand, counter nutate. That gives you more hip flexion, posterior weight shift. To unload, you compress, and then you you know you get pushed in the desired uh, desired direction. So I hope that kind of like trying to give a simplistic view of that. Um, I tend to speak more conceptually with that stuff than than trying to get into like you know the weeds of it because. Um, it's the it's the concepts that that drive this important that, that make it important. It's, it's these it's uh, these are principles of physics, not something that I've made up or Bill's made up or whatever. These are principles of physics, um, as opposed to um, a methodology. They may have a bias uh, one way or the other. You know, a, a bias of physiology, a bias of this or whatever. Um, these are just pure physics. Uh, only science that has first principles. Um, so there's not really a bias to it. It's just this is what's happening. You're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast, brought to you by Simply Faster. So you were saying, because uh, I think that's really interesting, and I, I'm going to go back through this later after the yeah. show, and I'll listen to it again. And I know in talking to Justin Moore, and every time I talk to someone mm-hmm. who's been exposed to Bill's work, I always have to listen to it multiple times and yeah, be I like, know. okay, I think this is starting to make sense. But one thing that I've... I've that's a bit of interest to me is the idea of um, just like like an impingement base. You know, we typically say, oh, chest out, butt, butt back and mm-hmm. squat like that or we we really drive that hinge pattern and it's kind of yep. extension driven oftentimes but then you look at the really good olympic lifter uh max ada i think pointed this out to me is the guy is like cleaning like 500 pounds and his his pelvis is actually like pretty neutral in relation to his spine it's not anteriorly tilted as he's in that like the bars about it is his knees position it's it's just neutral uh-huh. And I think so yeah. often it's like we create this over hinged paradigm where if I'm overly and so if I'm overly anteriorly tilted in a in a hinge, uh, 
that did you say that the posterior tilt it relates to the um inhale and the loading was that correct yes okay yep. so because i think about it, it's like if i'm gonna jump and it's a running jump i have to would ha- have to then have a posteriorly tilted ability to load the guts into the pelvic floor to prepare to take off but yes. if i just overly anteriorly tilted everything now i can't load my pressure can't i can't pressurize and so that was so, no sorry go ahead that no that, that goes back to your point earlier where you say this, your original question for all this was like you know can you visually see these things mm-hmm. and and you know i would say yes because you know it's a little different like you may have guys that are just really gifted uh you know like just plyometrically gifted to make up a term and and so they may not have uh, a lot of or need to get a lot of depth in their load so it's just boom boom you know it's a it's a you know springy rubber band it's a tight rubber band and we go and if they can go through like if, if i saw that guy doing that or girl doing that and they turn around and i know they can do a clean squat great that's you um be that guy you're a quick jumper that's going to be advantageous in a lot of situations but if you see an athlete doing that and and they can't they turn around and they don't have like you know they have like poor hip range and they can't squat and they try to turn or they when they squat they try to turn everything into a you know a box squat or a hinge which i'm not knocking any of those exercises everything has a place um and you know depending on what you want your outcome to be um then maybe that person is not loading because they just can't load. They can't, you know, change phases of movement. So what I mean by that is, is, is a loading is a phase, and then the structure changes as you go from loading to unloading. And and so, um, and we just talked about that with the expansion and the compression, and and then so, um, it just because it changes, or you know, because you you can't go through these phases you know, now we have to change that. And again, that comes back to why the squat's important to me because it, if you can squat well and you can squat well under load and whatever that is for a person, it's indicative of their ability to, to go through those different phases from, you know, again, unload or loaded to unloaded, um, you know, economically. And, uh, which as long as they have a high enough threshold and, 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 and the ability to, you know, ramp up force quickly, um, then, you know, that should translate into, into cutting or single leg jumping or whatever it might be. Um, but like the hinging, I, I think that the, this is my, you know, and I'm probably way off cause I haven't been you know around forever, but, um, our industry tries to find ways around faults. You know, how can I get this guy or this girl to squat when they can't really squat? Okay. Well, we use a box squat. They can sit down like this, or we'll teach a hips out like a butt out, um, you know, spread the knees. Out. So it'll be more, again, it's more of a hinge than it is a true squat. And so that's the fix to get somebody to squat who maybe can't squat well. And so we, the, the these methods kind of get built up over time and it's okay. Now that's how you should squat. Well, maybe if your purpose is, you know, power lifting or whatever it is, but like, if you want to be able to demonstrate full excursion of movement and to be able to go through those phases of, of, of loading and unloading, in my opinion, and I, and I think I can back this up, uh, you need to be able to squat well. Like I call it squatting in a phone booth and we don't have any phone booths anymore in this world, but like <laughs> if you can sit, if you can squat in a phone booth and not hit the sides, then that's a, that's a good squat. Um, if you can squat without arching, you know, you know, without throwing your chest up, like you, pushing everything forward. That's a good squat. Um, you know, and I was talking to somebody about this the other day and, you know, this person wanted to do, you know, uh, uh, wanted to start using barbell back squats. And I'm, again, I'm not opposed to anything. I'm just, does it fit where you're at? Well, when they did it, they squeezed really hard, you know, their scaps together, which pushed their chest really far together, which, now extends, you know, over, you know, arches the spine, overextends the spine, which anteriorly tilts, you know, the, uh, the, the pelvis, which limits your motion at the pelvis. So now I can't squat. So I have to hinge it or turn it into a box squat or a hybrid or whatever. So I just explained to that athlete, you know, what is one of your priorities? Well, it's, you know, be a better athletic defensive stance. Okay. So if I'm guarding somebody, and they're trying to go by me, 
and I've developed an athletic stance or, or a pattern where my chest, my center of gravity is forward because my chest is forward. Now my body is moving, trying to push me in the direction towards the guy I'm guarding, but he's trying to go by me. So how successful do you think I'm going to be? And, you know, just so just from like a pure, like, you know, center of gravity, physics, balance perspective, like not that successful. And you may be able to overcome that because you're, you know, athleticism or whatever, but from a position standpoint, you're starting in a bad place. Um, again, I'm not opposed to barbell back squats. I'm opposed to things that put you in positions that will make you less successful. And for this particular person, that was going to make them less successful because it would have accentuated their flaws already. Uh, and so, you know, you go to do more front loaded stuff, things that have that, um, uh, develop a posterior weight shift, teach them to load a little bit better. All of a sudden your defensive stand becomes better. You're able to, you know, lower your center of gravity in a cut, push out of a cut, things like that, have a better cut angle. Um, all of a sudden you're better defensively, you're better balanced front to back too. So, um, that's where like, that's just one example of how like an exercise, the variation of an exercise can either drive what you want to improve with an athlete or take an athlete in a direction that may be less, you know, less than ideal uh, for them. And again, I don't, I don't have a preference on any exercise selection. I just, my only preference is that it be the correct one for the athlete based on what they need. Yeah, I think that's powerful. I, I like thinking about how different minds arrive in the same like area at the first mm -hmm. Uh, I think the first time I actually heard anything, not not this concept just straight up, but the nuances of the pelvis was uh, it was at one of the first like rewire conferences I hosted with a uh, Darian Barr came in and taught for a couple days and and we were doing a hex deadlift and he was talking about not everyone just wants to put their hips back to go pick that bar up but that's going to mm -hmm. put you in impingement anterior tilt and he didn't approach it mentioned those terms he just basically went straight down to pick up the bar and then initiated the upwards with like a hips forward motion. And I thought it was a posterior yep. tilt. I, he didn't say, he said it wasn't a posterior tilt. I was still trying to figure out what exactly he meant. <laughs> Maybe I still, sure. but, but I've, I've kept that motion, what he was doing in mind ever since then. And I realized that like me ever since age 21, basically I've been on this steady, I had at least been on the steady decline of elastic, elastic strength and power. Cause all these hinging my lifts and, and yep. so you know, as I was thinking about that like with a hex deadlift, like that, that quick, like hip forward motion almost puts you in maybe that, like a quick load explode paradigm or something like that. Coming no, out absolutely. And I mean, you, you, you reference like a lot of Olympic lifters, you know, they, you know, once they get the bar past the knees, like that second pull or whatever you want yeah. to call it, like, you know, that's the hips got to come forward into that power position yeah. where, uh, the power position has the hips and shoulders stacked on top of each other, uh, and your knees are, are in front. So you're starting to get that, that, that shin angle. Uh, and you're starting to load the front of the foot. So yeah, your hips do come underneath you to start that, that, that last push, uh, up. Um, and then, you know, you talk about like, you know, you're losing elasticity and things like that. When, when you're in, constantly in that anterior tilt, you know, tight position, this, this, this kind of exhaled position, um, you, you tend to be like less aerobically, uh, you know, fit throughout like systemically. And I, this is, this is, again, this is, I, I said, you tend to be, there's, there's a lot mm -hmm. of situations where it's not. And so you're not getting like, like, you know, the tissues can become a little rigid, they become anaerobic and you may not get the same compliance uh, in the tissues that you, mm -hmm. that you would desire. Um, and so, because they're all just like, so, you know, concentrically oriented, so anaerobically driven, um, that you don't have that, that, that compliance. Um, and so, yeah, like you're probably, you know, you know, you're probably not getting, you know, that. And so that's another part about like, you know, um, you know, you think about like tendon, you know, like tendon, like, like a knee tendon notice or something like that. Like, uh, and, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on this, but, um, you know, one thing that you want to try to do is restore compliance, you know, in those tissues, uh, meaning their ability to, you know, to, to be, you know, pliable and move. Um, and so in order to do that, you know, you have to be able to, you know, again, like be in that loaded, uh, uh, pelvis position, um, and, and be able to, uh, you know, get tension out into the musculature, you know, so that, 
that, that the tendons can be compliant. Um, and and if, what I mean by that is if you don't have, uh, if you're not able to get like proximal control here, meaning you're not able to get to that, like, um, kind of, I know neutral is not a real position. It's, it's just a position on a map, you know, that we swing through, but like, let's call it for the sake of ease, you know, even this conversation, like that neutral position, uh, that, that, that counter mutated, that posterior tilt, uh, position. If you're not able to get there and kind of establish some inner abdominal pressure, uh, you won't be able to push, uh, pressure out into the extremities. Uh, and, and it's, and it's that pressure that gets pushed out that creates the tension in the fibers. And so then that's what, that's how we produce force. Um, so if you're not able to do that and you're using impingement to create that, that, that proximal stability, uh, then you've lost your ability to, you know, develop that, that internal pressure that ultimately results in, uh, you know, kind of the tissues, you know, uh, being able to create force, you know, and, and activate and things like that. This is this is gold. I, I don't even think we're going to get to the uh, the the kangaroo VVT gorilla, but that's fine. We'll save it for another <laughs> show because I like because yeah. this is huge. Um, so I'd never thought of it that way in the sense. Well, in my mind, I have like this chart going in my head, and it's like <laughs> if I'm in the weight room in a typical butt back, chest out, sit back experience, mm-hmm. it's like strength in the sense of um, lifting a wonder at max and, and maybe even muscle outputs, raw muscle outputs right. by themselves are going up. But then at the same time, it's like pressure is going down, pressure yes. ability. And also, I'd never heard anyone say this until you just mentioned it, but if I'm exhaled, I'm more, you said anaerobically dominant, and then my yes. muscles are less, com- like lose the elasticity in that state. Yeah. Why do they and lose the elasticity? Like, How is that? I mean, I don't, know. I don't need to know why. I'm just curious. I'm no, like, so they just like they become concentrically driven and in, in, in just like the system as a whole in this anterior tilt, like mutated sacrum exhale position is concentrically driven. And so um, you I want to say this the right way, but, you know, you you like you're not getting it's not a, it's not an environment that breeds expansion. And so you're not getting that, that again, that compliance, that pliability, the movement of the tissues. Um, and so you're just getting this kind of locked down, um, you know, situation with the fibers because you are so concentrically driven. You know, it's like um, a concentric environment is a rigid environment. It has to be for you to produce force. Again, you don't produce, like if you just relaxed or whatever and tried to bench press, like you're not going to produce much force. So to create you know, uh, a platform for force production, we have to create some kind of rigidity. And so we have to become kind of locked down. So if I can create inner abdominal pressure that locks down, you know, my, my thorax and, and pelvis that kind of mid part of my body. And so I have rigidity there. I've got stability. If I can't do that, I have to, again, impinge, I have to arch my back, tilt my hips, and I have to create that stability via like, you know, a bony structure. I'm leaning on a bony structure now in range. And so when I go to that in range, you know, when that's my uh, stability strategy, uh, I'm not creating a situation in my kind of thorax and my you know, pelvis where I have good pressure management. Therefore, I cannot squeeze pressure out into the extremities so that I get tension through the musculature. Again, it's a very concentric uh, it's a very concentric environment. It's a very rigid environment. So there's just not compliance throughout the system as a whole, but you don't get expansion, uh, you know, in the pelvis and the thorax. So you don't get the pressure being pushed, built up and pushed out, uh, into the, you know, into the, um, uh, you know, the tissues to be eccentrically oriented. Uh, so you don't get, um, you don't get the blood flow out there. So that's how they become anaerobic. Uh, very concentrically driven and very non-compliant. Cool. Is, that, is that an okay answer? It's a complicated <laughs> question. That like, yeah. there are, I'm certain that there are depths and layers that I'm not equipped uh, to like thoroughly answer. Um, but again, conceptually, I'm, I'm trying to keep it like you know the the terminology throughout this this kind of sequence of Q and A like like you know very consistent. There's probably an infograph that could describe it well. Podcast <laughs> talking about it, it's probably difficult. It's just difficult. I get it. I get yeah. it. I mean, basically, if you're anterior tilt, you're exhaled, you're rigid, you're concentrically yep. oriented. You're a weight room person. You're not as yes. you're, you're less of an athlete. And people talk about. I've been thinking about this the last really two three years more and more. Is people talk about. I think um, uh, I I don't remember if um, it was Boss Fun who were on the show, but I know Franz Bosch just talked about well, heavy squats decrease RFD. 
Well, is it the squat? Is it the squat? Is it the moving slow? Or is it all the stuff that we we're just talking about? Or is it a combination? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, it's all I, the above. Yeah, it's just a combination of it all, right? And, yeah. And so I just I just think it's really interesting. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask. sometimes oh, sorry, heavy squats can increase depending on where you're at in your yeah. training age. Sometimes heavier loads can increase RFD. So, again, you just pass that threshold of like, okay, this has served its purpose. Now I have, I'm at the point of diminishing returns. And so now heavy squats aren't going to serve me like they, they used to serve me. And that's a, that's hard for people to get past because if heavy squats have got me where I am and I'm in a good place, but let's say I've hit that point of diminishing returns to switch gears to something mm-hmm. that you don't know, like, and you're leaving something that you know has given you positive gains is tough to do mentally and emotionally. So like, you know, that's why we get stuck on, you know, uh, a one rep max methodology or apply med- whatever our method, you know, whatever our, our method, our preferred method is. That's why we get stuck there because I've had success with that. You know, why would I change? Um, and the truth is, you know, you're in a different phase in your, you know, your training age and, and development. So why you're not the same person you were three years ago. So why would you need the same things that you needed, you know, then? Mm-hmm. And, and so, no, I, I, I see that all the time in individual yep. sports, having worked in track and swim, because a lot of times we'll lift weights and we start doing some heavy squats and heavy partial squats. So we're seeing we're seeing KPIs go up in markers because of the power yep. output and the neural drive. But it's like at some Absolutely. point, your body's going to start to form a different cast, like like yes. as, as per everything we're talking about. And, and that's where I'm like these charts of like, it's like you have to... Because we get so anchored, because an athlete's going to be mentally anchored to that heavy squat. That man, I had this great year, and and I did so good. It's like, oh wait, but it's not what got you here is not going to get you there, you know. And it's I think it's just cool to have these in mind. So I'm going to ask you a quick TV show host lame question um, before we leave. It was just basically okay. So we know this is true. We probably should steer clear of like the hingy back squats, or we should obviously. Mm -hmm. But are there some you talked about reflexive core training early in this talk uh, so can you give us just a few ideas on on training the pelvis giving it experiences and exposures that will help athletes um, be able to I, I know squat in the phone booth we need to do that but I'll, even in, in all movements is there any uh, core and, and trunk and pelvis training techniques that you're using to try to facilitate and complement that yeah absolutely so um, I'll kind of answer this on two ends I'll kind of answer that on the like you know we got to be able to you know squat in um, I'm a bit, you know, I'm finding myself going back to like some, just some old, like, I hate the term old school. Cause I think like sometimes it has a connotation of disrespecting the thing. It's just, uh, it, it, there's a lot of gold in old school. And so, um, in, but like things like, uh, can you do a sit up without, you know, kind of hunching, hunching your thorax, you know, that, that tells me you can maintain like, you know, that inner abdominal pressure on a rigid thorax and, and move right there. Can you do reverse crunches? And because if you can do a reverse crunch, well, uh, you can counter nutate the pelvis. So you can, you know, okay. so then you're, you're coming up into higher degrees of hip flexion, even though I understand it's, oh, it's a uh, open chain. Uh, and so like, you don't have gravity that you're dealing with, but you've got to have the ability to counter nutate first or reverse your pelvic curve from anterior tilt to posterior. So, you know, that's a place that I'll go. Um, once you have that, like once you've demonstrated the ability to, to load, you know, and, and I'm not even talking like deep, like you, I'm not talking like 90 degrees of hip flexion load. Cause we never go there with cutting or rarely do, but like, let's say we're at, you know, six forty five degrees, 60 degrees, whatever it is. Like, um, you know, Lee has a great med ball fake throw series. So maybe we're, you know, if I'm going to, you know, uh, um, work on a left foot cut, I'm going to take a jab step to the left. And I'm going to fake, I'm going to take a med ball and throw it from my right shoulder to my left shoulder as fast as I can and then stop it. So what that's teaching, you know, your body to do is reflex, reflexively ramp up tension in the abdominals quickly, which is what you have to do when you go into a cut. So a cut isn't just about your, your cut leg. It's about managing, you know, your center of gravity and, 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 you know, the momentum, can you slow it down or does it like you know, have like the shoulder sway or does it lean forward, you know? And so you have to be able to be abdominals play a huge role in kind of managing the, you know, the internal momentum uh, and external momentum of your body. So that's a, that's one way I do that. Um, oscillatory isometric things like, you know, take like a a pal uh, press hold, relax, contracts and rack, you know, uh, kind of let the handle go then catch it real quick and bring it back to center. Things like that are the same kind of concept as the, uh, the fake med ball throws, um, another way to like, uh, I've been big with, um, uh, you know, trying to work on 
you know, the, the squat stuff um, with the counter notation is I'll go into like a step up position. So I'll just, you know, elevate, you know, passively put one leg in, in whatever degree of hip flexion I, I think, you know, I want to work on and I'll just do like a band pull down. And that's just an old, like, you know, then, then we'll transition to like, uh, you know, a band pull down marching drill. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully we get away from, you know, the band pull down because that's kind of like, that's, uh, you know, kind of artificial core activation. Um, I like to do skip variations where I'm doing med ball fake throws, uh, through the skip. Um, so I, I don't know, like, I think that's, you know, a lot of random ideas, but that's, um, uh, um, kind of how, you know, I look at things depending on the situation, um, like rapid fire med ball scoops is a good way to get a, a bunch of reps in on teaching the body at a low level, like a low velocity to, you know, reflexively turn the abs on. Obviously, the coach toss med ball into, you know, into a med ball scoop uh, is another way to do that. Um, so just things like that, like, you know, you just, you're just trying to ramp up. Like, you know, when you go into a cut, not only does the, the you know, the, the lower body and hit like, you know, have to, you know, kind of ramp up, become stiff and stop your momentum, but the abdominals do too. Uh, and so if I'm not good at it, just start with a low velocity, low, low amplitude, you know, you know, force that they got to stop and just build up from there cool uh, that sit up you the first thing you mentioned the sit up without hunching over is that um without extending or flexing <laughs> I, I, I wasn't sure what you meant by that yeah i like i just want like a you know like a rigid you know kind of thorax there so no no excessive extension no ex- excessive uh flexion um and then you know just i'll exhale as i sit up um and then you know okay. if i can do that and i know this isn't like you know like maybe super sound, but like what I have found is people that can do that are really good at creating the inner abdominal mm. pressure, um, and to, you know, to create movement. People that can't do that tend to hunch. They go into like flexion, mm. um, and, and, and to kind of get up. And so it's a really interesting kind of test to see like, Oh, that's where you're at. Uh, and it's, I found it to be kind of uh, like, you know, anecdotally true. It's like, you know, just kind of out in the weight room floor, I'd be true with that too. And so, the alternative to that is yes, they will. So let's say someone can't, um, like if you put a lot of pre- like stress on someone's abdominals to, to hold a position and they can't, the lumbar spine will extend. That's that you have, mm, cause it'll yeah. find impingement for support somewhere. Yeah. Um, and so, which is, so yes, flexion and extension, but you know, I want to make sure they could go either way, but I want to make sure that they, they don't go either way. Um, and kind of do the sit up with a rigid and sometimes I'll just even reach. Um, but, there's a difference between a reach and a reach with a hunch. A pure reach is just protraction without yeah. a hunch. Um, and then, and I think like we, you know, there's the population that uses reaching based methods. Um, that's a, that's one of the biggest mistakes I've seen made is that we allow flexion, like at that mid back, that kind of TA area uh, versus uh, just protraction of the scaps, just make your arms long. I love that. It's so simple, but it's just, it's yeah. such a, it's such a good thing to watch. It's just, it's not really ab training. If you'll, it's, it's pressurization training through that range of motion. So I, it kind yes. of redefines a lot of the things in a way, at least that we typically and, think of. And that's how, you know, this is just me. I, people have success in a lot of doing this a lot of different ways. I, you know, I, this is a long time ago. I had an athlete say, you know, I've got this, I do this, 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 uh, on my phone, I got this ab training app. Uh, and I, so I do abs all the time. And I said, I said, how's it going? You know, you, are you getting stronger? And I knew because I've been working with this athlete that, that he wasn't a great mover at that time. Uh, he goes, you know, I don't, that doesn't feel like it. And I said, okay. Uh, you know, so I educated him on like, sometimes we have to add context to our ab work, meaning like we have to do ab work that, that feeds us towards a movement that, or a position that we need to get into. So like, for example, like the reverse crunch, you know, to help, you know, getting a posterior tilt in a squat. Like that's a, that's a kind of a step one exercise, but it's feeding the skill of being able to do that, you know, to counter new tape posterior to, so you can get deep ranges in the squat. Um, you know, it's, uh, um, I use this exercise, like, let's say a guy has a hard time pushing off his right leg out of a cut. So we'll do like a one arm cable press. So like the cable will be, um, on my right side. So like, like horizontal to me and I will have them get their right foot out in that cut position and turn their hips to the left. So away from the cable machine. So now my right hip is externally rotated and, you know, we'll do cable presses there. So now I've got, so that the cable is kind of going out 
in diagonal. So it's kind of going laterally and in front of me. So there's an element of like a polish press kind of there, but I'm pressing out. You actually get a decent amount of ab with the right hip. You get you get external rotation of the you know the the external rotators are working on the right hip. So I basically like we've added the context of pushing off out of a cut, a, a right foot cut pushing off, but it's still integrating the core. Mm. It's tying it into the hip and it's adding context to his core training and therefore increasing his ability to do that particular movement skill. Um, so that's how I see like ab training right there, it, you know, from a, from an athletic performance standpoint, it has to be pushing us towards something, you know, whether it's increasing the amount of, uh, uh, stress you can handle and still keep a good position or it's, you know, finding a position that, you know, that, that you need to be able to find when you go into a cut. I love it. We'll have to put that exercise in the show notes if you have it. So, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, good stuff, man. Well, hey, I think we're, our time has run out. We'll have to talk VBT and kangaroos and gorillas some other Anytime. time. I'd love to have that conversation. Anytime. So, uh, well, thank you so much, man. I learned a lot, and it's and my I'm on the road. I selfishly do this all so I can become more elastic. So I've learned a yeah. lot of things today. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it, man. Perfect. I had a great time. Thanks, Joel. <laughs> All right, grateful to have another show in the books. And man, that was a good one. The squat library is growing and we are super happy to have Ty on the show. If you enjoyed this, you can uh, help us out by leaving a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever you're listening to. We totally appreciate it. Also wanted to give one last shout out to our sponsor, simplyfaster.com. They have an awesome blog updated regularly and an amazing online store with tons of the best of in each category of sport tech that you can get. So be sure to check them out and support them. We'll see you guys next week with another great guest. Have a good one.